Hello everybody, in this video I want to tackle the Windows activation mechanism again. And today's subject is the Windows XP activation algorithm. Hopefully I didn't go too far with this to cause any issues. So a quick disclaimer before we start. I do not condone piracy, Windows XP is abandonware. Product keys for it are long since widely available and later operating systems from Microsoft use way more secure and robust mechanisms to enforce software licensing policies. And most importantly, the main point of this video is to teach people basics of applied cryptography, since cryptography is awesome. With that said, by the end of this series, you should be able to generate your own valid Windows XP keys, or at least have relative understanding on how things work. A great place to start would be the Windows 95 checksum algorithm. As you may or may not know, Windows 95 keys are generated using a really simple and insecure algorithm. I recently even made ChatGPT generate Windows 95 keys for me. The current AI cannot do maths at all, so it was basically randomizing the key based on my prompt. There was some weird pattern to its randomness though, so it did succeed at generating the correct key at least once in 30 times. Point being, even the AI can generate the Windows 95 key. That's how laughable the algorithm is. I can't recommend watching a video by Stack Smashing more, where he showcases the algorithm and even the code behind it in depth. Go watch it if you haven't already. I did mention in the previous video that you could potentially generate Windows XP keys using AI as well, but I never elaborated on the algorithm itself, aside from giving little hints on how the product key is implemented. Honestly, this topic is really sophisticated and I don't even know where to start. What if I told you that Windows XP partially inherited the Windows 95 algorithm? That's right, that silly checksum divisible by 7 thing. Sounds intriguing, but how exactly did they make the algorithm more secure? Well, for starters, there's no longer just a license key. Beginning with later versions of Windows, Microsoft started using product IDs to identify each install. Here's where it gets interesting. A product ID looks rather similar to the Windows 95 OEM key. In fact, it has the exact same structure, except the sections are now fully repurposed. First five digits of the product ID marked as A represent the series of windows instead of the key release date in Windows 95. It is now a constant predefined for every Windows version and edition. For instance, you'll see 76487 in Windows XP SP3. Second three digits of the sequence, marked as B in place of Windows 95's OEM, represent channel ID, or site code as others also call it. Essentially, it's used to distinguish vendors. We'll tackle it more later. Third section, consisting of seven digits, represents the sequence number, marked as C, as well as the check digit marked as S. The check digit S is calculated by summing all digits C together and subtracting them from the next multiple of 7. In other words, it's a digit that makes the sum of the entire section divisible by 7. It's hard to tell why exactly they implemented it this way, maybe they wanted to add more uniqueness to each ID, or alternatively, they might have wanted to make software licensing backwards compatible, so older versions of their apps could identify the license state. Either way, I'm just speculating. The last section consists of the public key index, marked as D, which is followed by a triple digit random number, marked as E. The public key index represents the ordinal in a list of public keys, obviously, or to be specific, the public key that was used to verify the authenticity of the product key. We'll talk about it a little bit later in this video. The random number E, believe it or not, is used for phone activation. Specifically, it's used to generate an arbitrary installation ID for each machine every time. 
As I stated in the ChatGPT video, installation IDs are encrypted using proprietary 4-round Feistel cipher. That encryption is sensitive to change and therefore guarantees a different installation ID every time you generate it. We will not cover installation IDs in this video, as they're pretty much irrelevant to the subject and they use way different, less secure encryption. Let's talk about product keys now. A product key is that infamous 25 character sequence that you spend hours searching for online to no avail. In essence, it is a string of characters encoded in base 24. The alphabet it's encoded with is shown on screen. Why do you think that is? The answer is they simply wanted to avoid ambiguous characters in the product key representation. For example, 0 looks like an O and 1 looks like an I, so they just got rid of them both altogether. That's pretty smart. Let's assume we'd like to process our base24 key. First of all, we need to get rid of the dashes, as they serve no information. Good. Next, we need to convert each letter into its base24 alphabet index. This way, B is equal to 0, C is equal to 1, D is equal to 2, and so on until 9, which is equal to 23. We end up with a list of values which, together, represent a byte array. By that point, the task is far from complete. We need to decode our newly created byte array into a byte sequence basically a single integer, using the following formula. If you guys haven't had algebra or full-fledged calculus yet, this translates to the sum of array elements with the weighted factor being their position in that array. The closer it is to the beginning, the more importance it has. The result will be a 120-bit integer. We can write it out in hex bytes for better readability. Then, we have to account for the byte order. Since Microsoft decided to store it in little endian, we have to reverse the bytes. And there it is, we've successfully decoded a Windows XP product key. What did we achieve? Nothing. So far. Going forward though, I just have to note, you have to abstract from any logic whatsoever, because transformations I'll show next come from the Pioneer specifications. There is no logic behind them. Not only that, most of the research documents and papers on that topic I scavenged all across the internet mutually exclude each other and differ for each Windows series. I did my research, I found half-working code, I refurbished it, and it worked. So I'm going to put in my two cents here, tell you my perspective of things, and tell you what actually works. Beginning now, there is no agreement between the papers I found. You've been warned. The 120-bit integer we're faced with is a bit field. In total, there are four sections. And the first section, which is the least significant bit in little NZN, is the upgrade flag. If it's set to 1, the key is meant for an upgrade version of Windows XP. Otherwise, it's intended for a full version. The upgrade keys do work for normal installations as well. I did test it myself and was kinda confuddled. I thought my generator was broken and asked my team about it. So, back in the day when Windows XP first came out, my colleague Potsman purchased a genuine upgrade version of Windows XP Home and tested it on the full version media. It did work, and it does seem to be intended behavior as using a full version key with upgrade media is going to cause a special setup prompt. And this is exactly why most of the papers out there claim the bit is reserved and must be set to 1. In fact, for most installs it should be set to 0, but setting it to 1 does indeed work. The authors likely just didn't care enough, as the generated keys worked. And if it works, don't touch it, the golden rule. Next 30 bits contain the row product key. This section is essentially the product key, and it's exactly what helps generate the product ID, the string we've talked about previously. What's the rest of the information for then, if we already got all the data necessary? Well, there are two more sections to the decoded product key. 
let's call the combination of the upgrade bit and the row product key data for short. The remaining two sections, composed of 89 bits, form a digital signature allowing authenticity verification of the product key utilizing a public key. In short, you can divide that section into a 28-bit hash and the Schnorr signature, which occupies the remaining space. This is where things start to get serious. Let's simplify the task a little bit using maths. We have a 120-bit integer in front of us, but it doesn't necessarily mean there are no trailing bits. Let's go ahead and calculate how much information the product key in its initial state is capable of holding. We have 24 characters in total, which must occupy 25 positions. Using the alphabet capacity rule, we can confirm the capacity of such a limited alphabet is 24 to the power of 25 bits. That sounds like a lot. That's a huge number but 2 to the power of 120, that is the capacity of a 120 position binary alphabet, sounds much larger, doesn't it? Basically, what I'm trying to convey is that we can take a base 2 logarithm of the Windows XP key alphabet capacity, which will give us the result of about 114. That means the Windows XP key is only capable of providing as much as 114 bits of information at most. So we can just chop off 6 trailing bits from the signature. At last, we have successfully fully decomposed the Windows XP product key. That's still not it. It's important to note that Windows Server 2003 implements the product key in a completely different manner, as well as the 64-bit version of Windows XP, which is, in essence, just a reskin of the former. As far as I know, the 64-bit version of Windows XP uses the Windows Server 2003 key algorithm with an entirely different private key, which makes sense, as with each new minor version of Windows, Microsoft replaced the private keys Pyre successfully cracked with their updated counterparts. I'll give you a brief overview of the raw product key format for Server 2003, but I won't go into generation details to keep the video concise. It's that same 120-bit integer with 6 trailing bits derived from the product key using the exact same algorithm I've just explained. There are 5 sections though, there's an extra one. First bit is left unchanged, it is the upgrade flag, and the full version compatibility strategy for that bit remained the same as well. Next 10 bits are the channel ID, which is just an integer from 0 to 1023, right? Since that's the available alphabet for the field of the 10 bit power. Technically, it is true, but you probably recall the channel ID from the beginning of our journey. And it's not a coincidence, in fact, it is literally the BBB part of the product ID, the site code. So logically, any number larger than or equal to 1000 is considered invalid. You will just not be able to encode a product key using that BBB channel ID part. I want you to wager a guess on what next 31 bits could potentially contain. Oh, you might be wrong here. It is not the sequence number, nor is it the RPK. It is a 31-bit hash, followed by a 62-bit Schnorr signature. We still have 10 bits left. Uh, the last section is reserved for the backend authentication key. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, where the key generation efforts crumble. There is no possible way to generate a guaranteed valid key for Windows Server 2003. Microsoft had enough of piracy, so they just implemented the backend algorithm, which is obviously behind an NDA, and anyone who had seen it before is held under the penalty of perjury to not ever disclose the validation algorithm. Microsoft got the idea. No matter how computationally difficult the key validation algorithm is on client side, it cannot ever be secure. Even a simple lookup table with a salt algorithm on Microsoft servers is safer, because nobody has access to it. Nobody knows how it works. 
It's a black box validating our keys. And Windows Server 2003 was the first operating system by Microsoft to incorporate direct online validation of the product keys. This is the practical limit of key generation for Windows. The last system you can guarantee generate a valid key 100% of the times is Windows XP, as there is no backend validation involved. And even though it's cryptographically questionably secure, although after 22 years it's not secure at all due to Moore's law and that, all that good stuff, it's all client-sided. Though since Server 2003 does not have access to the internet during the setup process, the backend key, or well, just a 10-bit number, is not being validated. We can guarantee getting through the setup process and then stay activated until we connect to the internet using our generated keys. That's not bad. So key generation still kind of makes sense with Server 2003. And if you follow through and you know a bit about Windows XP, you might say, but Andrew man, there is also OEM activation for Windows XP and you made a video on it and it's your most popular video. Aren't you supposed to activate it via the internet? And no, even though you're served an installation ID and you're supposed to reach the call center for the confirmation ID, or you can just activate using internet connection, it is still client-sided. What they have on the backend is actually just a duplicate of what's already there on the client side. So you don't actually have to reach out to Microsoft for confirmation IDs and all that. And we also learned to generate confirmation IDs for Windows XP and Server 2003. I'm really hyped to show all of that to you in one batch. There's just so much nice mathematics to talk about behind the scenes. But I can't. It can take hours. I can take hours. TLDR, hyperelliptic curves, genus 2, divisors, Jacobians, and Feistel cipher. Uh, yeah. Mesmerizing. Gorgeous. I love it. I'm all for it. Please don't ban me, YouTube, please! Either way, I think I'm going to finish this episode here. I'm dividing it into series because this kind of content is rather difficult to ingest and I can speak about this non-stop for hours. In this episode, we've discussed over the product ID and both of the Windows XP key structures. In the next one, we will look into elliptic curves, product key validation and possibly key generation. So yeah, until the next episode, take care.